Okay, we'll get started. Good evening, everyone. I'm Keith Crumwoody, Dean of Architecture at California College of the Arts. Thanks for joining us tonight for this lecture, Architecture for the Collective by Joyce Wong, the opening event of the Spring Architecture Lecture Series. Please note that should you want to, you can enable closed captioning at the bottom of your Zoom window with the live transcript button. At CCA, we understand land acknowledgement as a transformative act meant to confront our place on native lands and to build mindfulness of our present participation in colonial legacies. California College of the Arts campuses are located in Weichin and Yelamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively, on the unceded territories of the Chichenyo and Ramaytu Shaloni peoples, who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and the Americas, included in their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA honors indigenous peoples, past, present, and future, here and around the world, and we wish to pay respect to local elders, including those in the lands from which you're joining us virtually today. If you'd like to learn more about CCA architecture, please visit scaffold.architecture.cca.edu, where you can find our lecture series schedule, watch videos of past events, and read stories by and about our students, faculty, and alumni. And now, Adam Marcus, Associate Professor and Co-Director of the Architectural Ecologies Lab here at CCA, will introduce our speaker. Thanks, Keith. Um, it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce Joyce Wong. Joyce is Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Studies at the Department of Architecture at the University of Buffalo. She's founder of Ants of the Prairie, an architecture and research practice exploring new forms of ecological engagement. In her words, confronting contemporary ecological conditions through creative means. Her work has been awarded, published, and exhibited widely with accolades including the Architectural League Emerging Voices Award, grants from the New York Foundation for the Arts, and the New York State Council on the Arts and two McDowell Fellowships. Most recently, Joyce received the exhibit Columbus University Research Design Fellowship, during which she designed and constructed the installation to middle species with, with love for last year's exhibit Columbus Biennial in Columbus, Indiana. As you'll see tonight, Joyce's practice often focuses on designing, prototyping, and constructing habitats for species other than humans. These architectures for birds, bats, insects, reptiles, and other more than humans are notable for their innovative and beautiful use of material uh, scaffolds for all kinds of life. Joyce's practice models ways that architects might engage with ecological systems more directly, more productively, and more carefully than is often the case. I would argue that this approach is not merely about expanding one's client base to include other species. This is certainly central to the work, but I think there are bigger questions and implications at play here. Joyce's larger project is one of decentering and recentering, challenging our hierarchical human-centered mindset by forging new models of kinship with other species and with the natural world. This shift in perspective opens up possibilities for empathy, mutualism, and a broader ecological awareness in which we as humans can reassess and reconceive our own actions within a much more interconnected ecosystem. The history of architecture is punctuated with moments of, of willful withdrawal from so-called real world problems, moments in which architects have been tempted into um, self-referential and hermetic pursuits. I would argue that our current moment in which human existence is increasingly defined by climate change and uncertainty is precisely the opposite. It is a time when we as architects and architecture students should chart new ways for our discipline to engage more broadly in ecological thinking. Joyce's work does this and suggests how we might meld our disciplinary knowledge of form, space, materiality, and construction with an ethos of ecological awareness and activism. In this regard, her practice has been really important reference and inspiration for our own work here at CCA in the Architectural Ecologies Lab. And so we're, we're really thrilled to have Joyce here tonight to kick off our spring lecture series. So please join me in virtually welcoming Joyce Wong to CCA. Joyce, it's all yours. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Adam, a very generous one. And I'm uh, just really happy to see um, everyone virtually and to see so many familiar faces and names. And um, thank you, Keith, also for the invitation. Really, really happy to share our work with you. 
Um, so the um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, just a second. All right, hang on a second here. Can you see this? Yep, you can see. Great. So um, yes, the title of my talk is Architecture for the Collective, and I'll spend a couple moments in, um, in the beginning just sort of zooming out a bit to to discuss um, to discuss what I mean by this and to reflect a bit on who our audiences are. Um, and this goes to what Adam was just saying in his introduction. Um, in conventional practice in architecture, of course, we understand the role of clients as our audience and stakeholders. But and of course, outside of that, there's users. And yet outside of that, there there are other inhabitants as well. And this is the kind of this third category of publics is one that I that I have been focusing on in my work. And this is a, a kind of audience or a set of stakeholders that are that in my mind are affected by architecture and its consequences, but doesn't necessarily all have a voice in its processes, not um, not like our clients or who we think of as typical clients. And so along these lines, um, uh, one of the questions I've been grappling with over the last decade or so is thinking specifically about the conflicted perceptions that we have as humans in sharing our spaces with non-human species. Um, when we think about cities and um, buildings, we don't think of these as animal, animal territory, even though they are, you know, of course, part of our ecosystem. Um, and this is a kind of scene of, a, of um, just a development that I took in Las Vegas, where, you know, something that was kind of a a full habitat in this in this desert was wiped away, you know, obviously with with um, urbanization and housing development. And so while we like to see birds in the park or in our backyard, this idea of um, sharing buildings with, uh, uh, you know, in build or sharing animal sharing buildings with animals is not something that's that's commonly accepted. And we see this in the kind of artifacts that we design for for buildings. In the United States, um, much of our urban fauna is actually categorized as nuisance animals. In New York State specifically, and this is taken from the from the New York State DEC website, um, there are actually laws about animals that you can kill at any time, and these are the ones kind of outlined in in red. So, um, despite the fact that uh, there's all these regulations placed on our environment, our um, our buildings and landscapes, though, are always appropriated in unexpected ways, um, such as this under maintained or unmaintained house in Buffalo. So when you look at this, it looks um, completely, you know, dilapidated and but actually it's teeming with all sorts of different forms of life. Another example is, or, you know, the crumbling under maintained or unmaintained structures like this wall become actually great habitats for urban species. And this, in this um, image as a biologist that I work with, who's pointing out all of the kind of crevices and as possible habitat spaces. And um, so the fact that we're sharing cities um, with many species is, is, is really important. It's the fact that we are not alone on the planet. Um, or in our cities is something that needs to have a much broader cultural resonance. And uh, biodiversity loss is a is a huge global issue. That's something that needs to be at the forefront of our thinking and design. Um, but a big hurdle in achieving this is, in my view, the conflicted uh, view that humans have toward animals in cities. And so um, we might see birds as desirable creatures on the one hand, but then when we see a situation like this, where they're encroaching, where it appears that they're encroaching on our space in unwanted ways, uh, we, you know, we become uncomfortable when actually, in fact, it's us encroaching on, on their space, right? And so how do we address this conflicting perception of nature, nature in quotes, in cities, um, especially, you know, in situations like this? And this is a, um, a, um, a photograph of a of a vacant housing, uh, former housing building in Buffalo, um, when the presence of nature in these kinds of underserved neighborhoods are often associated with lack of care. So uh, these are the kind of many questions that are sort of in my mind in my work. Uh, many years ago, I started thinking about uh, ways to reconsider building typologies um, as a, through a kind of adaptive reuse in some of my speculative projects. And so for example, this is a series of models that I created to look at how building facades might be designed to uh, and adapted to allow for more animal habitation, specifically thinking about bat habitation. These are just some study study models, speculative study models. Um, and uh, here's another collage looking at a kind of similar uh, idea. 
But simultaneously at that time, I also started developing a series of small scale installation projects. And this is the first installation that I, that I um, built called Bat Tower. Uh, it's designed to draw awareness to bats as, um, you know, as important species, important non-human species, and to promote their, um, their presence in our, in our landscape. Uh, here's another view, another couple of shots of, of bat tower. Um, the design of, of this project comes from the tendency that bats have to roost in small, thin, thin tight spaces. Um, typically, when you're seeing um, when you see bats inhabiting attics or other structures, you see that they're able to kind of crawl within very small openings, usually about half an inch thick, um, crawling between boards, hanging between boards, and so on. Or in Austin, Texas, in the kind of expansion void joints of a bridge, for example. Um, and so the idea, the spatial and tectonic idea for the project was really one of layering spaces. So thinking about how you can create a series of slotted spaces that are layered um, with these kind of thin crevices that bats can climb into. And what you see here is, as well in the kind of um, grooving here, uh, that's, those are grooves so that bats can actually cling and climb in um, almost like a bat ladder. And uh, looking uh, down into the space, the interior of the project was conceived of as a kind of a vertical cave. Um, and and uh, so also looking at these kind of uh, small thin spaces, of course, and looking up in the tower, um, you can see um, with a thermal imaging camera that the kind of top of the tower where the kind of bat habitation is, is a little bit warmer. And that reason for that is because of the sort of dark colored wood at the top that absorbs more sunlight at the top than at the bottom. And of course, we were also thinking about the ecosystem of the bat. And so uh, we planted a number of herbs and, and vegetation at the base to attract insects that would also attract the bats. And the project was also sited adjacent to, to a pond um, that also had a lot of insects and mosquitoes, which are good serve as good food for the bat. And some uh, photos of the project under construction, a kind of um, uh, funny thing that happened is during the process, I actually learned how to operate a rough terrain forklift as part of the process. So I'm always excited to kind of show this photo. Um, and uh, here's the project again, when we, when we completed installing it. So along similar lines, we developed another project deploying uh, similar or spatial sensibilities, uh, looking again at the kind of um, the kind of thin slotted spaces and this kind of idea of like layering. And this is a project called Habitat Wall. It's a prototype project for an exterior wall that would be built on the side of an existing building. And so here you can see that it's composed of a series of structural bays between which are um, these kind of modules that each contain um, bat habitat uh, um, zones, but also bird nesting areas, uh, as you can see in the top ones. And um, here's a view of a particular uh, or of a study model looking at one of the bays of the wall design. And here you can get a kind of closer look at the sort of crevices or these kind of slotted spaces and the bird habitat at the top. Uh, one of the ideas of this project was also to reuse material. And so what you see here is a lot of um, salvaged wood and also salvaged building material, such as these shutters um, that were actually, um, you know, that we actually got from a green demolition company and we repurposed this material in making the bat habitation spaces. And so here's a view of the um, construction going on in the shop. Uh, the project was part of an exhibition called Outside Design at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And uh, here's some photos from when it was installed there. What I found really interesting was that, um, that this guest of the exhibition on the right actually found it interesting or somehow wanted to lie down on the floor and look up into the space. In a way, this is um, what she's doing here is really trying to kind of emulate what a bat might see when they're flying in from the bottom. So I found this uh, to be particularly interesting. And the next intervention uh, that I'll uh, mention is called Bat Cloud. And um, here uh, I was interested in creating a, um, a kind of an artifice that you might stumble upon in a location where you might not necessarily expect it. So if you're walking around through the woods, you might, um, so this, uh, this is in a nature preserve. You're, if you're walking on a trail, you might see from afar a kind of floating cloud or floating mass, but closer up, you would see that's a series of hanging pods um, hanging vessels. 
what these are is um, each of these vessels actually contains these kind of bat habitation areas at the top and the bottom part is a sort of planter for vegetation. So the idea of the um, of this project is that if the bat, if the uh, upper areas are inhabited by bats, that it would be a kind of self-sustaining system where the guano from the bats would drip down and sort of fertilize some of the plants and the planters below and so on. And uh, the project was um, cited, as I mentioned, in a nature preserve. It's a place called Tift, which actually was formerly a dump site for the city's garbage. It was the city's landfill in the 1950s and 60s. And in 1972, Tift was transformed into a nature preserve. Uh, but because of its status as a, as a nature, nature preserve, we weren't actually able to dig into the ground in order to secure a foundation or to, in order to create a foundation for the project. So we actually ended up using the existing trees on the site as the kind of stabilizing factor as the structure for this project. So you can see in this drawing that there's a number of cables that are crossing from tree to tree. And here's some more, here's some photos of the project being constructed with like relatively um, uh, simple means in, in our studio space and uh, the installation process. So one of the things that has been interesting about this project is the, num the uh, reactions that it has provoked. Um, when the project was installed in 2012, uh, I, I got a lot of emails from people, and I'm not sure if it was the kind of effects of the material that has made it a kind of unexpected encounter, or if it was something about how this you know, was in a kind of very public place in the city, but it caught the local population's attention. And so when when this was installed, I got a number of emails from people in Buffalo who were just asking me questions like, could you help me get bats out of my house? Or could I sell them one of these pods? Or could I help their Boy Scout develop a bat house for an Eagle Scout project? And so from all this kind of communication, I started realizing that, you know, even though this is a very small project, um, probably the lowest budget project I've ever worked on, um, and a very small one indeed, that even though the, this is a small project, there's something about the kind of resonance of projects that I think is able to instigate curiosity in a larger way. And I think um, in a sense, it starts to combat the kind of stereotypical image that we have of bats and other so-called pests by giving kind of positive attention to their existence um, and and uh, rather than you know vilifying bats and combating what I've been calling uh, the aesthetics of invisibility, so trying to either vilify or make invisible um, certain animals, and so of course um, the act of provoking curiosity is is really important because it brings awareness to issues like white nose syndrome, which is a major ecological crisis. It's a disease that's killing off bats in great numbers. Uh, in, in caves, it's a it's a fungus that that affects their hibernation period, and um, but this this is something that is hardly on the public radar. And so in my in my work, I'm very interested in activism as a kind of first step. In an, another sense, uh, I think an interesting aspect of developing these small projects has been instigating of some very productive collaborations with other disciplines. Uh, for example, throughout a lot of the work for um, Bat Cloud and Bat Tower. I formed a collaboration with a biologist named Katarina Dittmar, who is shown on the right. And um, she started off as a kind of consultant who I would just kind of talk with about issues from site selection to thinking about materials and textures. Um, and we even actually taught a studio together a few years later after, I, after doing those projects. And from this relationship, we've developed a number of initiatives like um, thinking about ways that architectural products can be part of kind of ongoing science experiments and so on. Um, and another kind of, I guess, uh, kind of byproduct of, of thinking about uh, the effect of these kind of small scale projects is to think more pointedly about how architecture can be conceived of as a form of activism. Um, I've become really interested in the issue of bird glass collision, as many architects have. And as you probably know, um, this is one of the leading causes of fatality in birds in urban areas due to the fact that birds can't see uh, clear glass and typically fly into it and die. Um, and of course, there's already a number of organizations and efforts that are that are um, happening to work on addressing this issue. There's bird safe building guidelines. They, we see the, um, the invention of bird safe glass uh, on the lower right hand side, which is, you know, glass that has a kind of ultraviolet coating um, in it that allows what that birds can see that humans can't. 
Um, there's even the development of a lead pilot credit for bird collision, um, anti-bird collision. Um, but I was really interested in exploring this issue in a visceral way through another small project. And this is a project called No Crash Zone, which is a temporary renovation of a glass window. Um, the idea of this project is to make uh, the logics of bird strike prevention more visible through this graphic pattern that would at once sort of serve as a kind of interference pattern that where you could see, you know, the fact that it's an interference pattern for birds. But at the same time, this is a um, design that also kind of draws attention to this desire for uh, the kind of humanist um, human desire to kind of look out through windows through these kind of frame views. Uh, I specifically kind of invoked the one point perspective in this so that it sort of emphasizes that view looking out out the window. Um, and in fact, here's a drawing of the, the pattern that was that was used for this for this window design. And um, in this project, I was interested really in seeing this kind of um, a project that would address the conflicting interests on the one hand, our desire to save birds from crashing and dying with gla by glass windows and on the other hand our desire for frame framed views and clear views out of windows thinking about similar issues i developed an installation for birds um, in collaboration with an artist uh, based in new york city named ellen driscoll and um, this next project i'll show is called bauer it's basically an installation um, in located in an art park in Western New York, that's a series of building-like fragments that are composed across a landscape. And each one of these fragments uh, contains, a, well, this is a view kind of looking at it from another angle, but each one of these frag building-like fragments uh, contains uh, bird nesting boxes at the top, and they're uh, designed for seven species of local birds, including um, and uh, taken into consideration, not just the kind of opening sizes, but also which direction they're facing and their heights. Um, and each fragment also contains a number of glass windows that each have um, bird vision interference pattern on it. There's the kind of dot matrix that you see on there, but also includes um, custom drawings by the artist, Ellen. And all of these windows contain uh, our, well, let me see if I have a better view of it. Oh, no, sorry, that's the only, that's the last image. Um, so all of these drawings actually are drawings of local um, birds and plants in the, in the Buffalo, Western New York area. And so speaking of collaborations, um, I mentioned interdisciplinary collaborations before, and this most recent one with the artist, Ellen. Um, I've also started to work with another architect named Nerea Feliz, um, an architect based in Austin, Texas. And when we work on projects together, we go by the name of Double Happiness. In 2019, we started working together on a project in Madrid, Spain. And this was part of a, a larger group a curated group of designers to transform an open plaza in um, at, at the former municipal slaughterhouse in, in the city. And this, this um, former slaughterhouse, which is called Matadero, is now a major arts institution in, in Madrid. There's a lot of programming that goes on in the interiors, but the outside of, the, of this um, complex, the kind of exterior plaza spaces are largely, largely empty, except, I mean, they do have program, pro programming, but there is a lot of heat and there's a lot of intense summer sun there. And so oftentimes you just don't see um, a lot of programming in, in the outdoor spaces. And so we were one of five designers that were tapped to really look at some ideas for how to kind of bring, um, try to mitigate her urban heat island and sort of bring um, ideas to kind of, to use this outdoor space. So one of the things we were interested in was to try to incorporate local plants that would um, mitigate urban heat island, but also attract pollinators. And so we're looking at a number of um, insects and, and uh, butterflies and um, plant species pollinators and, the, and related plant species. Um, but we were generally also very interested in uh, some of the lesser known qualities about insects and how interesting insects are. So for example, um, uh, um, it, so here's a, a few of some moths and how they're attracted to you know, light at, at night, which I'm sure everybody is aware of, but also looking at things like butterfly vision um, and how butterflies see certain colors and UV reflected light more prominently, uh, which is um, one of the ways that they're able to target flowers in a field. So we're, this is um, a series of images by a filmmaker, Don Sueos, uh, who was um, looking at kind of images of fields of flowers and, and rendering them as if a butterfly were looking at them. Um, so some of the colors stand out more than others. 
And so for our project, um, our proposal was a series of urban furnishings for the plaza that would all function in different ways. Some of them would support the growth of trees. Some of them would provide places to sit down. They also um, serve as kind of um, expanded planters for wildflowers and other vegetation. Um, we developed a, one of a prototype called Arthropod Cinema. This was a, an idea to kind of create a situation where people, visitors could witness a spectacle of insects through their projected shadows and also working again with this idea of positive phototaxis, which was, as I mentioned, the tendency for insects to be drawn to light at night. Um, here's some images, another drawing of that. Um, there was a lot of um, thinking about how the planters and furnishings would incorporate certain colors that could mimic some of the camouflage qualities of flowers and perhaps also attract butterflies through coloring. Um, and thinking about um, caterpillar habitat was also important. Um, caterpillars are often the source of conflict in the sense that they eat plants, uh, you know, so gardeners get annoyed with them. Uh, they also, the, some of the plants that they like to eat are plants like milkweed or stinging nettle or other plants that are perhaps less desirable for, for humans. Although, of course, everyone's now, if once, once somebody is interested in monarchs, suddenly, you know, milkweed is a de desirable plant. But we created a, another set of um, prototypes called Caterpillar Refuge. And um, in, th in this case, the planters would would um, serve as um, not just a, serve as a refuge in a few senses. One is that it would provide the kind of plants for them in these gardens, but also serve as protection from predators. Um, another um, prototype was an idea about a human cocoon. Um, and this is a prototype that integrates uh, or that brings a kind of intimacy that creates a kind of intimate space for humans to, for a small group of, of humans to kind of gather it within a kind of um, sheltered area or kind of not in, not totally enclosed, but a kind of like uh, intimate area where you could sit together with, you know, a partner or sit with a kind of friend here and that the wall itself would serve as a would um, have a series of these kind of insect vision um, devices embedded within them that you could sort of look out and see the world as if you were an insect. So the rendering on the right is a kind of approximation an idea about what uh, insect vision might potentially look like. And here's another view of some of the kind of insect habitats in the surface that we were imagining for this project. And uh, we created a series of models showing these photographs, or sorry, these um, prototypes. So um, here's a few of the models. Um, ultimately, a lot of the this project, um, the kind of schematic development of this project was um, um, shown in an exhibition in Matadero. Here's the kind of, uh, I guess, the final setup of the of the exhibition that shows our models and also the drawings in in the back. And so I'll, the next project I'll talk about is um, also kind of brings up another kind of collaboration. Uh, this is this is one um, that was it was so interesting as a kind of collaborative process that actually ended up we ended up writing a paper about the collaboration. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But in, in 2017, I somehow ended up in Australia on an artist residency, and through that. I uh, developed a working relationship with an ecologist named Darren LaRue, who's there shown with the kind of fluorescent vest. And um, he's part of the Department of Parks and Conservation and also a digital designer named Mitchell Whitelaw, who's a professor at the Australian National University, um, who I had met previously at an academic conference. And so this collaboration is something that uh, that, uh, that actually started with this, um, this academic conference and it sort of, sort of just continued and kind of turned into a project. Um, so the project is called Life Support and it started with this tree that was slated to be removed from uh, by the city of Canberra in Australia from a residential neighborhood because it was deemed to be hazardous. And this is something that happens quite a lot in cities in Australia where you have a very old eucalyptus tree where the branches are falling and um, they're falling on neighboring houses and so they're, they're slated to be removed. Um, but a very large tree such as these kind of 400 year old trees um, have incredible ecological value in enhancing biodiversity. And in fact, this was a topic that was the research focus of Darren, the ecologist. And so, um, and typically when these trees are removed, they're just, they're chopped up in small pieces like firewood and taken away. And so um, the three of us had decided that it would be great to remove a tree in as few pieces as possible so that it could be used so that it's kind of um, all of the properties of the tree itself could be could be used in a, in, a, in a project. 
And so uh, we worked together to figure out how to, you know, remove this in as few pieces as possible. And um, here's a photo of um, some of the pieces being being taken away uh, to a site called Bearer Hill, um, which was a uh, an ecological offset zone in Canberra that um, was pretty. It's pretty. It was pretty um, barren in terms of trees. It didn't have. It didn't have any trees on it, and they were trying to renew. The, they're they're in the process of renewing this landscape through all these different plantings. You can see all these pink, pink. Um, uh, kind of, um, well, pink uh, um, cones, they're not really cones, but enclosures are basically enclosing the saplings on the, in the landscape. And, um, and so the idea of the project was quite simple. It was basically um, to find a way to use the tree and all of its parts to create an artificial vertical habitat structure in a site that didn't yet have um, enough trees or vertical habitat. And so here you can see um, the tree parts propped up um, with the idea that some of these tree offcuts could also serve as um, bat and bird nesting boxes. And here's a plan of the project from above. And um, in the house where the little girl is oh, thank you. Um, and uh, and here's uh, an interesting aspect of this project was for us that we also had to develop a way to understand the geometry of this because this, this tree in order to actually work with it as an as an object had to be understood geometrically. So we learned photogrammetry. Here are some images of that process um, and that enabled us um, to model the tree in three dimensions, uh, mostly done by Mitchell, the digital designer. And, and by doing this, we were able to understand the tree in a much more precise way or all of its parts in a much more precise way. Um, and uh, to the extent where we could even uh, use the model to develop um, to develop construction drawings with the structural engineer. And so, um, so here are some photos of the project under construction. It was finally completed in 2019. Uh, here's another photo of it under construction. I've yet to receive um, an actual completed um, photo of this project because as soon as it was finished, like the pandemic kind of started shortly after. So I'm still waiting to actually hire a photographer to go take photos. But um, one of the exciting aspects of this project is that we mounted a number of camera traps on the structure to detect and document animal occupation. And the, the footage from this feeds into a kind of citizen science like database called Malangolo Life, which is being managed by Mitchell Whitelaw. So that's another kind of um, part of the project that has been, has been ongoing. And the collaboration, as I mentioned, between the three of us was so, um, to me, it, to us, it was, it was so interesting how we, how the three of us worked together um, that we actually started documenting the process. I made this timeline to try to understand how we were working together. And um, we wrote a paper about it. And um, I think one of the things that I always reflect on here is just how we can rethink the seemingly, seemingly clean logics of the architect's triangle. Like when we think about collaboration, like who does what part and so on, um, you know, in the architect's triangle, it's always about a kind of series of relationships between contractors, clients, and architects. But how can we kind of rethink the triangle and reveal some of the more messy relationships between collaborators to better describe the nature of shared authorship, not just between individuals, but also including the role of institutions as well and, sh and shared interests. And so anyway, this is something that I've been kind of thinking about quite a lot. And Thinking, and speaking of further collaboration, um, I'll touch on another project um, that I've been involved with as part of uh, the University of Buffalo Department of Architecture's Ecological Practices Group. Um, so I'm part of this group here and at UB, um, we teach classes together, but we also sometimes um, uh, work on, on activities that lead to certain projects. And so here I'll show um, a project that was a result of of a kind of activity that was developed between um, the university and a local industry named um, Rigidized Metals, which is the owner of a place called Silo City. And so um, the next project I'm going to show is a student design build um, project. This is not my own project, but it's a student design build project that came from this relationship that um, the university had with Rigidized Metals. Um, and and um, Back in just to maybe kind of uh, tell the story a little bit back in 2012 rigidized metals was starting to renovate uh, some of their buildings on the property and they wanted to remove a giant beehive 
And at first they were going to bring in a beekeeper to basically just remove the beehive. But we um, talked with them, the faculty that I was working with talked, and I talked with them to find a way to create um, a new habitat for the bees rather than removing them completely since the bees were already thriving in, the, in that particular location. And so, um, and I'll show some diagrams to kind of maybe explain some of the collaborative processes here um, between a few of us um, and, um, and rigidized metals and, and um, a beekeeper, we developed um, an idea for a student competition. This was something that was a multi-phase competition that included um, first, you know, first a number of student teams, but then kind of narrowed it down to a number of finalists. Here's um, some images showing some of the finalist project, um, which are uh, a kind of mound, um, a kind of tower, a box that would hold the beehive, and also an arch with the with the beehive underneath. Um, after more during and kind of looking at the finalists, there were two um, there were two finalists uh, selected, and ultimately this project won the the um, the tower. And so this is a project called Elevator B. It was designed and built almost completely by students with faculty and advisement and also fabricated in some part by rigidized metals. Um, and the way that this works is, um, is that uh, it's basically a metal stainless steel kind of exterior skin that's on a steel structure. Um, inside the structure, there's a, a kind of, well, the students call it a B cab, but it's really referring to a kind of elevator cab. But it's basically a kind of elevator like uh, kind of um, wooden box inside that is raised and lowered with a pulley and when it's raised up, you can look through this piece of glass and you can see the beehive in there when it's lowered. Um, the door aligns with the opening of the exterior skin and you can open the beekeeper whoever is tending the beehive can open the door and deal with the bees inside so and then the comb started developing again once we once we removed the um, the bees from the from the window and moved them into into this into this hive, and I think one of the uh, funny interesting moments of the development of this project was during the construction process before the project was actually installed, while the students were still building the project in the shop. Um, the Buffalo News, a local newspaper, published a story about how this group of students was building a beehive in Silo City, which is a post-industrial piece of land in South Buffalo. And the comments were quite funny, um, as they always are in, in the news, but not exactly what we we're hoping for. So the middle one particularly is funny. Um, I don't know what to say. The waterfront ideas each presented each week get increasingly worse. Next week, we'll read that some other fringe group has decided to plant 14 acres of poison ivy on the waterfront and water it with recycled wastewater from the city, all paid for by grant from the US Botanical Society, a new 14 member panel appointed by the governor to explore the best possible uses for a waterfront that he will never visit. Um, so, you know, not the greatest comments that we wanted to hear, but thankfully, after the project was completed um, and it was built, then um, the tone of public opinion started to change quite a lot. And so not only was it reviewed publicly by uh, trade uh, media, uh, you know, for architecture, but also by um, um, media in, in more mainstream or, or popular culture. And even as, um, you know, as I said, this is from 2012, but even as late as 2019, we were still seeing this project popping up in, um, in, this, in, um, in this case, this was in CNN travel before the pandemic when people were still traveling a lot for, um, you know, 4th of July, in 2019, um, there was a mention of Elevator B as the kind of cover image for why Buffalo would be one of seven inspired ideas for the 4th of July holiday. And um, so all the projects that I discussed are, are quite small. Uh, I like to think about the potential of interventions in, in cities. And um, so I'm going to show a project that's kind of that's more of a speculative project in a, in a kind of more urban scale thinking about thinking about um, how we can um, how we can sort of expand our thinking of 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 um, non of habitats for non human species in a in a larger broader way, and so I like to think about you know a, a city as buff like Buffalo, post industrial city, not just as a series of vacant spaces and empty spaces, but instead as one that has the potential for small interventions to produce an aggregation of effects, and um, so a project that I worked on that. Um, um, that kind of spoke to this a little bit was was a uh, project to reconsider zoning codes in Buffalo to reimagine possibilities in our built environment. 
So, I, and this is looking at the kind of former zoning code, which has which was in effect really since the 1950s, since the early 1950s, and really um, is not in effect right now. But I was I was exploring the zoning code at the time, and then at this point, I think it's still interesting to see how it can be effective. So this is a um, this is a the zoning map of Buffalo from this time, from like around 2009 or so. And uh, I was analyzing the code, of course, it's, you know, looking at a lot of text. And I started categorizing a lot of the kind of restrictions and limitations of the code and, and the kind of criteria of the code in this diagram. And what this is, is basically showing what's possible in residential, one residential, two, and so on, moving upward. One of the things I noticed is that in all of, and I started color coding this based on what these, what these implications are. And one of the things I noticed is that all of the code or all of the kind of restrictions that are highlighted in green indicate um, a requirement for a setback, um, a requirement for a setback of 50 to 100 feet, um, if the property, if the industry, if there's a prop, if there's um, a boundary with residential on one side and industrial on the other side. So in a kind of in a property where there's residential and an industrial, you need a very very large setback. That you know, if you think of 100 feet, that's like half the size of a block in Manhattan in New York. And so I thought, okay, well, what's what's happening with these setbacks? And a lot of spaces look like this, like where you see a huge amount of land where there's really just stuff just piling up. And so I think one of the things that became interested in is how if there's a perception that something is a restriction and a kind of setback in an industrial area, there's just not a lot of care or attention placed in that. So I went through, again, the city map and started outlining all of the boundaries between in, um, um, industrial and residential, um, looking again also at Google Maps to outline some of these areas and started taking these kind of walks. Well, this is showing through Google Maps walking through this area, but also doing some like actual driving and walking these areas too. And what you see here is like, you know, industrial on the left, residential on the right, and these very, very large setback on the left side. Um, and so I started to think while I was looking at all this, what would happen if we looked back at the map, outlined all of these areas that are boundaries between residential and industrial and started connecting them through um, vacant sites, through parks, through green spaces to make a much more connected um, green network through the city. Could we start to think of them not just as setbacks and not just as kind of unused spaces, but instead as, as having potential to be connected to other green spaces to create, to combat habitat fragmentation and create a much more connective network. Another thing I started looking at in analyzing zoning was all of the areas that are marked in blue are basically, um, basically uses that require that you have a either six foot high wall around your property or that you have a wall with no windows. And so that's something that results in a building like this one on the left where it's in some kind of industrial use and then it's a building with no windows. And so I started to think, well, could we start to also think about all these as potential sites for a kind of more generative, a more kind of productive surface rather than a blank wall, could we not start to make these into habitat walls? And so the last project that I'm gonna finish with now is- um, um, Yes, hello? Okay, sorry. Yeah, the last project I'm gonna finish with now is um, the most recent installation as, as part of Exhibit Columbus, which as Adam mentioned, is the biennial design exhibition in Columbus, Indiana. And the theme for this year's Exhibit Columbus was New Middles from Main Street to Megalopolis, which was developed by Mimi Zeiger and Iker Heel, the exhibit's curators. Um, for, for our contribution to, the pro to Exhibit Columbus, I started reflecting on this idea of what I was calling middle species as opposed to flagship species. So um, flagship species being animals that we often think of when we visit zoos and so on. So they're the kind of you know, polar bears or animals that we, that we think of when we think of you know, animals that we like. Um, middle species on the other hand are animals that are completely embedded in our environment but are often overlooked. Even though um, there are neighbors, there are community members but we often don't necessarily regard them as, as such. And so in looking at sites in Columbus, um, I was looking not only at these fantastic structures in the, in the buildings there, so this is North Christian Church by um, Aero Saarinen and Dan Kiley, um, but also looking at the sites, uh, looking at the sites for traces of non-human inhabitants. So th this is the kind of map that was made by um, me walking around carrying my, um, my echolocation bat detector. And here's another, um, what you see on the right is basically me carrying all this um, equipment and, and so the map on the left is, is showing um, some of the kind of detection, some of the rec bat recording that, that was picked up as I was walking around Columbus, Indiana. 
Um, I was also looking for other traces of animals. Um, you can see the turtle crossing sign. Uh, there was a number of other species that we started to kind of notice in, in the area. And we became interested in this idea of occupational habitat strata. So what's living in the air or what's kind of in the air versus in the ground. So thinking about animals at different levels. And working um, with uh, um, some of these ideas about creating places for bats and birds above and terrestrial amphibious species below, um, we created um, a number of study models um, uh, showing, showing this kind of condition. Indiana, by the way, has 13 species of bats, including the endangered Indiana bat. Um, which has been known to use a type of um, bat house called the rocket box bat house, which is sort of shown um, kind of the uh, prototypically in the in the um, sketch to the right. And um, this was an idea that was being that I used to kind of develop a lot of the kind of bat house tops of the project. Uh, the project was cited in Millrace Park, which is um, by an amazing park by Michael Van Valkenburg and with structures by Stanley Sadowitz um, from from your city. And um, and it's also here's so here's the kind of initial view of the of the project, which is a kind of series of nine towers uh, that kind of all kind of um, reference the the Sadowitz Tower in the back as well. It, it's sited at the confluence of two rivers at the edge of the park, and um, I was really interested in the local material ecologies as well, looking at stones and also local Indiana wood. And I'm going to basically kind of scroll through. Um, a number of process photos relatively quickly to kind of give you a sense of the project. But um, after this, I'm actually going to show a video of um, I'm going to show a video of of the um, that, that explains the project a little bit more. So I won't talk about these as much. But here's images of us working in the shop um, on site. And um, Here's kind of stacking stones, which was, um, uh, oh, you know, the kind of crevices between stones are great for, for um, amphib small amphibians, small animals, um, small reptiles, um, toads. We found uh, that while we were building the project, these toads were actually trying to hop into the project. So we actually were documenting some of this that was happening as we were building it. Um, and here's some kind of finished, finished uh, images of the project. And um, one of the interesting aspects of this um, project is that we were collaborating with Indiana Department of Natural Resources, who loaned us a number of bat detecting and recording equipment. And we've been um, a really exciting thing, which I'll share with it, with you in the video as well, is that um, with um, using this equipment and, and collecting bat sounds, we were collaborating with a couple of musicians um, who took the bat sounds and started making bat music out of it. And so I have. Um, well, first I'm going to play this and hopefully you can hear this. Can you hear this? Yeah. So this is what a bat sounds like. If I mean, obviously we can't hear a bat with our naked ear, but when when bats are when when we use um, um, echolocation detectors and uh, to uh, we can we can hear them through the, these these devices. And um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm going to start sharing the video so that you can see the project um, more completely and you can also hear some of the music that the that the two musicians composed and that will that will conclude my presentation so just a second while i share again the video just a moment You see this? Yeah. All right, so I'm going to play this video and this will conclude my presentation. One of the most rewarding aspects of being part of Exhibit Columbus 
was bringing together our community at the UB School of Architecture and Planning to learn about the incredible legacy of architecture and landscape in Columbus. In the early phases of the project, I engaged a number of student groups to work with me in exploring and researching the city. Early participants were students from AIAS, American Institute of Architecture Students, UB NOMAS, National Organization of Minority Architecture Students, and Double ASAP, African American Students of Architecture and Planning. These students worked with me back and forth between Zoom and in-person model building to develop and visualize the first design ideas. My graduate assistant, Nicole Sarmiento, played an enormous role in really developing the design of the project throughout the spring semester. Mark Bajoric, our structural engineer and my longtime collaborator in Buffalo, was a critical part of our team as well. In tandem with the design process, I conducted a graduate studio that looked at Columbus and asked students to research the city and develop speculative proposals to amplify habitat for middle species in the region. As a compendium course, my colleague Gregory Delaney taught a seminar that explored the landscapes of Columbus through research and drawing. At the UB School of Architecture and Planning, a culture of making is emphasized in the kinds of projects that we do and also in the way that we dedicate our attention and resources. For Exhibit Columbus, I was keen to explore the culture of materials, not only in terms of their performance, but also in terms of life cycle and sourcing. So early visits to material suppliers, such as Estes and Hope Indiana, as well as looking at the Indiana hardwood industry influenced the material ecology of the project. In terms of fabrication, I was also very interested in highlighting the community of makers in Buffalo. Our materials and methods shop is fantastic and it's one of the most used and beloved spaces on campus. It's not only an incredible resource for design studios, but also for seminars and even some large lecture courses, such as structures. Our shop manager, Wade Georgie, is really the secret ingredient to making design build projects happen. For our project, he not only coached us all in welding, which was pretty much new to everyone on the team, but he also fabricated critical components and in the face of some of the supply chain issues that impacted our schedule, Wade also helped us secure a good part of the lumber that we needed to construct our project, and he even donated some decade-old salvaged steel from a past design-build project at the school. In addition to three members of our original team, a number of additional students and alumni pitched in to help us fabricate the project throughout the summer. The installation process in Columbus was supported and really made possible by the local community. We were amazed by the level of care and attention that Vince Rubio and his team from the Department of Public Works put into all of the installations. And we are very grateful to Tim Coomer and his team from the Mill Race Parks maintenance crew for all their help. And personally, I was thrilled to learn how to operate a boom lift thanks to the staff at Ogles Rentals. Additionally, we were energized by the enthusiasm of all of the volunteers from Columbus who helped out, including the Environmental Club of Columbus North High School. But it was really our dedicated crew of three UB students, Nicole Sarmiento, Bethany Greenaway, and Shavin Doe, who were at the heart of the installation process. I can't say enough about how hard this group has worked, not only during the hot days on site, but all throughout the summer. Additionally, we are so grateful to colleagues and friends who made an effort to join us for a little time in Columbus to lend a hand. Greg Delaney, Albert Chow, Lisa Ramsberg, and John Pipkin. I think one of the most exciting things that has surfaced from this project has been the expanded network of collaborators that we've started working with. Early discussions with ecologists, and especially with Tim Shire from the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, steered the direction of the project toward an ambition to conduct research on bat populations in a more engaged and dynamic way. Through Tim, the Indiana DNR is loaning us a number of ultrasonic bat detectors and recorders, which are continuously collecting bat calls that will add to the DNR's database. Additionally, we formed an exciting new collaboration with two sound artists, Sean Cheeky and Enochio, or Zach Williams, 
who are taking the bat calls as source material for producing soundtracks by digitally processing and mixing the sounds, which is what we are listening to here. Okay, thank you. That was great, Joyce. Thank you so much. Um, we have about 20, 25 minutes for questions, um, which I'm sure we will have. Uh, as you're aware, because you, you spoke to a small group of students last semester here, right? So there yeah. are some investigations at CCA um, that are uh, sort of aligned with the work that you're doing um, back in Buffalo. So it's super exciting to see the work um, and, and to see the inventiveness with which you're bringing sort of, you know, kind of uh, to the skills of the architect to, to bear upon um, larger questions of the environment and, and uh, kind of mutually, what do you call it, mutualism, Adam, right? Um, redirecting our attention to, to non-human species. So if you have a question, um, you could raise your hand, which will kick you right to the front of the queue. Um, there's a raise your hand button at the bottom, or if you don't want to actually um, come on mic and give your question, you can type your question in the chat and uh, I will read it for you. This is our first lecture, so I know everyone's a little rusty with this. Okay, I'll do, um, this is a lesson I learned from, from uh, deans that I worked with before um, when they didn't have their own questions or didn't want to hog the mic. So I will identify some of my colleagues to maybe um, put them on the spot to ask a question. And Adam looks like he's concerned that I might ask him to do this. <laughs> um, but maybe because your video is live, I see Shalini too, who like, uh, Shalini, you look like you maybe have a question. I have a question. Awesome. <laughs> Hi, Hi, Joyce. Hi. <laughs> it was so great to see your work. Amazing. My question is probably kind of, um, you know, you're working with all these bugs and bats and animals and critters. Which one do you align with? Align? <laughs> yeah. I bet well, you had to, I bet you had, I asked that question because you had to think like them. 
Yes. So I'm curious to know, like, hmm. which one feels like your bug? My, my spirit animal? <laughs> your spirit um, bug? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, of course I align with bats because I work, I mean, so many of my projects involve bats. I think I've, I've always been really drawn, and this, uh, this has to do with, like, this idea of middle species that I had mentioned. I'm, I've always been drawn to animals that are sort of under-recognized or sort of I don't know, the, the ones that might have a kind of bad reputation for some reason or another that just totally unfounded, um, those that are vilified. So I don't know, I, I don't know if this has, if this is some psychological thing about my upbringing, I have no idea, but, but, <laughs> but I, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think, I also really think, um, I don't know, it's really, that's a really good question. It's hard to say, but, you know, but I've been drawn to, to those types of animals for sure. <laughs> Thank you. That's really interesting. Sure. Thank you. Um, you don't want any of them to hear you claim another, right, Joyce? As like your your well, favorite. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I, it's like the I bats actually, are listening. Yeah, I don't know. I was in conversation with somebody else today who was asking not that exact question, but just like what would be the next animal to work with or something. And and actually it's it's just hard to say because like um if it's like when you identify one animal that's really you're really actually working with the whole ecology it's not about necessarily one animal or the other animal it's really like well how does um if you if an if a singular animal is identified how can the kind of working through that animal as a kind of representative species start to kind of amplify all um and so an animal i've been really interested in thinking about is cats for example um, because they're on the one hand, um, uh, you know, animals that we think of as like part of our family, they're domesticated, they're like, they're, um, we love them. But on the other hand, they're also kind of like glass, they're also major killers of birds. And um, there are some places like, for example, in Australia, where they're actually coming up with, you know, um, some rules, some regulations to keep cats contained or to, to create cat containment facilities. So what do we do when we have a kind of conflict of opinion about about animals? Um, that's something I'm just generally, so cats have, I've been really interested in too. Or like, we have a couple of questions in the chat, but I just want to drop this question behind Shalini's question. Um, like, and it's it's a slightly unfair question. So, so recognize that at the beginning, maybe not, but Okay. Um, are there are there species that you are drawn to because they provide greater architectural opportunity for you? Oh. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you yeah. see, like, oh, I could do this thing mm -hmm. if I've got like if I'm working here rather than there. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. I think one of them is spiders. Um, I've been really. I think spiders are incredible. They're the architects of the animal kingdom. I. Um, I love, uh, I think spider webs are amazing. And certainly there's artists that work with spiders. It's, it's not like a new thing, but I think um, the potential of, of, of what spiders can do is, would be something that, you know, to really draw from both in terms of, you know, studying the way they, they work um, as, and the kinds of forms that they create and also the structure of spider webs are so incredible structurally. I have a, there's a spider web that always forms on, on the rear on the side mirror of my car and the and then the kind of by my car and it will stay there for an entire season without blowing off you know even if i'm driving you know 80 miles on a highway it's like the spider web will stay there and i and i don't remove it because i'm just like really interested in the fact that it that's able to withstand all that all that wind um but yeah i don't know i think that's that's definitely one that comes to mind right away <laughs> Well, that's interesting because that suggests I can't remember there's an artist or probably several artists that are doing this, but I feel like I saw a story maybe years ago about someone actually choreographing like bees building a beehive to actually like give it a particular shape to sort mm. of slightly change its function. So the idea that you uh -huh. also might, um, you know, contract with other species to actually like build structures. Um, uh -huh is kind of fascinating, but that's not a question. That's just an observation. But we do have mm -hmm. questions from some of our students. And also from uh, the first question, I'm gonna take these in order. Uh, the first question from Nigel Ng asks, um, when will you be holding your next exhibition? And uh, when will you be coming to Singapore to hold an exhibition? Um, so Nigel, you might have to like set something up, maybe, to yeah, bring I mean, to Singapore. I would love to go to Singapore. I haven't been, I haven't been yet. But um, 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't know when the next exhibition will be. I mean, I'm working on a couple of things that I right now that I can't really talk about too much yet because they're still sort of under wraps. But um, but uh, one thing that I'm doing now, which is not an exhibition, is is that I've bought a vacant lot in Buffalo and I'm developing a, a project for my vacant lot for a house for myself, for my myself and my non-human friends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're spiders. Right. Uh, Conrad, uh, one of our students asked, to what extent do you consider designing spaces for ongoing human to non-human interaction versus designing space habitat restoration in urban landscapes meant for non-humans only? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I've really, really been interested in uh, interaction between humans and non-humans, even, even though the projects themselves are really look like they're just for the animals. I think the human is a very important component in all of it because if they're if the projects are even though they're they house not or they're meant to house non-human species, um, the human beings are are really the audience of them as well. Like they're meant to kind of be part of our kind of cultural uh, landscape. Um, but in terms of direct direct relationships and and on um, between humans and non-humans, I think um, what I'm hoping. What I'm hoping to do with this building design that I that I just discussed or that I just mentioned briefly is to kind of bring some of these ideas to bear to really kind of use it as a sort of demonstration to show, um, you know, a possibility for say an expanded wall or expanded roof condition that can enclose that could be kind of suitable habitat, but it would be immediately adjacent to the kind of human spaces. Um, and yeah, so so hopefully hopefully something coming soon with that. <laughs> Great, um, Kevin Pham uh, asked Kevin. I'm just going to ask the second part of your question where you synthesize a little bit. Um, how do you prevent, or how can you prevent, the wrong species? And I think this is interesting. Maybe even thinking about what the wrong species might mean um, from inhabiting the spaces you've created. I.e., if you've designed something for bats, like how do you address like some other species taking control of that space? Yeah, that's a really good question. One one way, I mean, specifically for bats, like one of the things that you can do is to make, um, make the spaces smaller. Or he says non-native bats, actually. Non-native bats? Yeah. Well, for bats, one of the, actually, one of the issues that will happen is that if you if you make the, the gaps like too big, um, then, then there might be other types of animals that start to kind of get into it. But but so you want to make the gaps like small enough where really it's just the kind of North American micro bat that will that will fit in um, into the spaces. Uh, for things like bird houses, um, oftentimes if like so this is this is actually a kind of uh, an issue. Um, sometimes if you're it, like we developed for Bauer, there is a one of the bird houses is actually um, was actually developed in mind for uh, with with purple martins in mind. And so the whole, I can't remember the size of the opening, but it was something like two inches, which we then later discovered was too big for, um, because other, another, a certain type of like wasp or I can't remember what it was, but there was some other species that we really didn't want to have occupying the installation that, that would have occupied it. So we ended up putting a wire mesh behind the hole. So sometimes there's air, there's ways to fix it, to fix things if there's um, unintended consequences. But I think, um, at the in the in the grand scheme of things, it's really it's very hard to control. Um, yeah, it's very hard to control these things because, um, and I also am not necessarily a fan of using the term invasive species either. I think there's um, there's I've been more of a uh, I, I tend to use the word adventive adventive species instead of talking about invasives. Oftentimes, non-native species even. Um, uh, can be okay. Like it just because something is non-native doesn't necessarily mean that it's that it's hurtful. A non-native species or an adventive species, if it's naturalized and kind of and and um, fits within the kind of ecology in a, in a beneficial way, can be can still work. Um, so it is a kind of give and take, and it really I think a lot of times that you really have to rely on ecologists to make calls about things like that. I, I think as an architect that while I have sort of um, some thoughts or I'll have an opinion, I really rely on the I'm the ecologist and biologist to make that call. If that makes sense. <laughs> Any other questions? I had a question. Yes. Hello. 
Hi, Natalie. Nice to meet you. I really enjoyed your lecture. Um, I was curious because, the, a lot, of course, all of your designs are mostly in urban cities and kind of urban environments. Like, so you're talking about like the human interaction, and I would imagine that you have to place a lot of faith or trust in people to essentially um, take care of and mm -hmm. maintain the integrity of these structures that you're putting so much care into. So I guess my question is to what degree are you considering the ways in which people could have like a negative impact? Like, because it's such an urban environment, there's so many people like, there's things like vandalism or people who just don't agree with the design and could essentially yeah. ruin it. Um, like are mm -hmm. the that your design, uh, I guess that informed your process or the ways that that prevents that, I guess? Um, a little, uh, somewhat. So. Um, I mean, just as a, a couple of examples, I, well, for one, one, I guess more of a general comment is I, even though there are things like, you know, um, vandalism that might occur, I, I don't necessarily put that at the forefront of my thinking when I'm designing projects, or I, I'm not necessarily, let's say, um, worried that it's going to happen, even though it often, it sometimes does. In fact, something did happen to one of my projects, which I'll explain a little bit later. But um, but I think one of the things that you have to do is to try to kind of preempt certain things, like if you know that something is climbable, for example, um, to try to figure out how to make it less climbable, um, you know, for, for humans to kind of, uh, I feel like this is something that happens a lot where if there's like a little step or some kind of uh, you know, horizontal bracing um, somewhere that's low enough where someone can climb it, then that it invites climbing. Um, so there's things like that. Uh, one of the projects, so Bauer was um, vandalized. It wasn't, but it was really more of a kind of random occurrence. It wasn't something where somebody was against the idea of having bird, a bird safe glass windows. It was, um, or, um, you know, collision free windows. It was, it was, it, I think it was just a bunch of people who were sort of in the park that did something to the windows and they cracked, so they're being replaced right now. So it it, it can happen, but but um, but I think it's I guess the maybe the thought is just like well, if anything could be vandalized, so we have to you know you still should you know still I still am interested in putting things out in the world even if there is that threat there. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, Thank you. Sure. Uh, Martin, you phrased your hand. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, you mentioned that you're working on a house for yourself. I'm wondering, are you kind of building some of these non-human habitats into that structure as well? Kind of like taking the cues from some of these speculative sketches that you showed at the beginning of, of the project. And I guess like, do you see that as an important evolution of the work kind of merging these kind of structures and habitats like even closer with the fabric of the city? Yes. Absolutely. I, I am really interested in, in um, experimenting with how some of these earlier ideas that I had about making a kind of expanded, um, you know, expanded habitat wall condition, and so on, how that can be integrated into into the house. I think, um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I think, in addition to, to it just being a building, and I haven't started, you know, building it yet. Right now, it's still in a kind of design phase. But I think one of the other concerns, um, as well, in addition to, you know, the into, in addition to putting, um, you know, human spaces adjacent to these, to these kind of spaces designed for non humans is also how it's perceived by the neighborhood, it's in a kind of residential neighborhood. And um, I'm still kind of, you know, in my mind, thinking through how I'm going to talk to the neighbors about what I'm doing and whether it, how they're going to perceive it. Is it part of the house? Or is it part of a kind of backyard experiment? Or is it part of a, you know, guest house and how, how that relationship is going to be um, developed? But yeah, that's a, it's something I'm very interested in. Any other questions? I, I think it's it's all so fascinating, Joyce. And um, you know, I imagine like you're, you're you know, architecture mostly we deal with inert stuff, right? Um, extract materials, and then we like whether it's wood or stone or cement, whatever it is. Um, and you're dealing with you know uh, species who have different needs than us, 
whose needs intersect with other species in very complex ways. Um, I'm totally fascinated now with the notion of actually engaging the species in the production of the things that you're making. Um, but it, it, it just leads me to think that, you know, in some ways you're moving in this territory between architecture and landscape architecture. I mean, landscape architects deal with living things primarily um, in the work that they do and have to recognize and plan for actually transformation in the designs that they put forward, unless they're like serious, crazy formalist, right? Where everything's being sculpted all the time. Um, so I, I sort of wonder like where you see the work going as you begin to become more familiar with different species, right? Like, I think the, it seems to me from, from the presentation that the, your growing understanding of the complexities of the things that you're dealing with. Um, yeah, so it's an open-ended question, but you know, what are next steps? And maybe your house, maybe your vacant lot that you're doing your house on like presents a sort of, you know, case study for some of this. Yeah, um, certainly that. I, um, I'm also working on a, um, a larger sort of more of an urban exploration right now that I, I can't really talk about it in two specific terms, but it's, um, but it's looking at the relationship uh, between, well, it's looking at, at, um, at, at, uh, at how, um, by kind of these um, habitecture enhancements to buildings or to kind of, um, to certain properties might start to enhance biodiversity. So I'm also th I'm thinking at building scale, but also thinking about how this might, um, how to kind of do research at a at an urban scale. So, um, right. yeah. We have uh, two last questions. Uh, one, another from Conrad. So Conrad, I'm going to save yours for the end, so we can get Henry's question. How do we, instead of creating uh, quote specific particular place to harbor non-human species, how can we integrate them in pedestrian walkways in urban areas, for example? They're not only found mm. in the parks, but are also seen in the ordinary street. Um, yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, there's actually, an, and some of you might have seen this recently um, in a, I think it was like a design boom article or something. There's there's already a number of companies and people who are making um, habitat bricks and these kind of small structures for for um, bird habitats or bat habitats. There's a, a company specifically that does this, it's called Schweigler, it's based in Germany. Um, and so when you see these uh, these bricks um, for, uh, the one that was that was shown on, I think it was De um, Design Boom um, a few days ago was a, a, a brick that was made for solitary bees. And so if you think of like building components and building materials having the possibility of of insert, being inserted within a kind of vernacular or kind of standard conventional building, um, there's definitely a way to kind of integrate, the, um, you know, habitat much more discreetly into the built environment where it's not just kind of like, you know, an installation for bees or an installation for bats, but that it's part becomes part of the part of the building itself in a much more um, kind of in a much more direct direct way. Um, so that's certainly, I would say that's certainly one way to do it, um, integrating into walkways. Um, yeah, I think I, I think one thing to do is to think about the street as, um, it, you know, when planting the street, maybe think about like how trees can, can work on streets, like planting more trees, um, creating more sort of vertical structures that might create um, habitat on in streetscapes. Um, yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh Jeanette Kim has a question. Jeanette, do you just want to ask your question on mic? Sure. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Joyce. Hi, Jeanette. Nice you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited you're here. Um, I was so interested in the way the way you started your lecture kind of enabled me to reflect on the kind of question of vacancy and neglect of urban environments in relationship to the animal architectures um, world. And um, it seems like there's a challenge there, right? Because there's so many preconceptions we all have about what's a properly maintained space. There are like HOA regulations about it and, and you know, broken wind, like theories about what makes, uh, about what leads to more policing in cities and things like that. So I was just curious to know if you've been advocating for different standards of maintenance or what's considered to be kind of proper <laughs> in uh -huh. cities in your own work. Yeah, no, that's such an interesting question. And you know, um... It's funny because I was just uh, in in Buffalo, specifically in Buffalo. Um, that's it's a it's an interesting question because there are so many buildings that are under maintained that are 
uh, you know, that that are have broken windows or boarded up windows or things like that. But there's so many that um, that it I I guess like as a citizen of the city, I don't I don't find myself in a position where I'm saying, oh, we need to come up with we need to develop different rules um, because it's not so much that they're like it, neighborhoods are not being policed in a way to for people to kind of you know clean up their windows just because there's so many that it's actually just kind of more of a normal part of our landscape i would say um but i i but i think a lot about the question of preservation what your your question makes me think about preservation um we have uh, we have some buildings, for example, recently there is a, 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 a um, one of the most important grain silos in Buffalo, um, which is called the Great Northern Grain Elevator, is uh, um, was damaged in a windstorm. Uh, a whole bunch of bricks were like knocked off of one of the facades, and um, and the the owners of the building have basically been neglecting the building for a very long time, um, and, and and they pulled an emergency demolition permit for this building, which was ridiculous because this building is actually landmarked so there there's it's historically important it's the only brick box building um, grain silo left in north america and possibly the world and it's now under threat of demolition just because of one because one side was demolished or not demolished but but damaged and so i think there is that attitude there um that if something that was that should be maintained but or something that you think of that should be maintained um is damaged that that it's now you know something that you know now it's a problem i think that attitude is um i don't know yeah i'm not sure where i'm going with this but i think like um i think it it involves just a kind of bigger discussion about preservation and what we need to what we need to think about preserving or not um in in cities and so yeah so i guess back to the question of um preconceptions and um i i just think you know and again, I guess this is the this is the thing that I'm wondering about with my with my houses. I feel like there because there are so many um, you know buildings that have the broken windows that have you know um, wildlife and and kind of growth all over the place that are seen as undesirable and seen as you know seen as places with lack of care. It's like how does one create a place that has all of these kind of qualities but looks cared for? You know, how do you kind of create something like, for example, um, how do you create a garden that doesn't need the kind of regular maintenance or how do you kind of create or how do you create a maybe it's even something that um, that kind of where one has to work, um, not just in, in terms of thinking about single family houses, but working in a more kind of community scale thinking. Um, so I don't know, that's not really a great answer, but but that's a really good question. <laughs> I think, and um, we're almost out of time, but uh, Connor has a question that I think is, is an interesting maybe wrap up question, Joyce. Um, sure. He asked, uh, have you found that some of the species have modified your designs in surprising ways? Um, have any species modified my design? Well, um, one of the surprises came in Exhibit Columbus. Um, I mentioned, uh, I showed the, the photo of the toad sitting in the, in the stone. And originally we had thought that, uh, you know that the level that we had placed the base at um, would be sufficient in terms of all these kind of sm small animals getting into the space. But um, while we were building it, it, actually we could actually we literally saw a toad struggling to get into the structure. We looked at the toad like jumping up and not being able to jump into the structure. So we started actually um, we took a number of, of flat stones and started stacking them around the base in order to help. Kind of create more of a step for the toads. I mean, this is a very banal example to a certain extent, but but um, but you know, the things like that happen where you're where you think that a height or a dimension because it's like it, you know it was relatively short. You're thinking, oh yeah, that's like short enough. A toad can hop that high, and actually they struggle. So um, yeah, so it, the, something like that has happened. Um, but uh, I, I'm I'm sure there are others, but I um, can't think of one. Off the top of my head right now. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no graphic standards or Neufert's for you to turn to to understand any like stowed, you know, toad accessibility standards. Right. right. Um, really interesting. Um, Joyce, thank you so much. This was really a wonderful way for us to kick off the spring term uh, with the public programs. It's been a really pleasure to have you. Um, I'm even more feeling like, you know, uh, like sometime in the future when we can actually have people here, like, to have you come and maybe workshop with our students and some of our faculty would be a fabulous opportunity. 
for us. Well, I would so, love that. I love San again. Francisco. Yeah, well, thank you for the invitation. It's nice to see you all. It's good to see <laughs> you. And good night, everyone. Um, look to scaffold for our next lecture, which I think is in two weeks, but um, I don't have that in my head right now. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Joyce. Thanks, Joyce. That was great. That was awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you.